Welcome to the HCD Podcast Mindset, your go-to destination for exploring the fascinating realms of behavioral science, neuromarketing, and consumer research. I'm your host, Michelle Nigella, and I'm excited to lead you through today's engaging conversation, brimming with insights to ignite your curiosity and enrich your understanding. In today's episode, we are privileged to welcome Alex Wu, the visionary founder and CEO of W2O, a flavor technology firm revolutionizing the food industry for the past 15 years. With a deep understanding of contemporary taste and smell neuroscience, Alex specializes in crafting better food using cutting edge, clean label, plant-based ingredients. His expertise is sought after by food and beverage companies worldwide as he leads efforts in new product development, including salt and sugar reduction and enhancing multi-sensory eating experiences. Now, before we dive into our conversation with Alex, a quick reminder to like and subscribe to our podcast to stay updated on all our thought-provoking episodes. And don't forget to explore our website, www.hcdi.net for additional resources such as white papers and conference presentations. Now, whether you're commuting, working out, or simply unwinding, let's embark on another curious conversation right here on HCD's Mindset. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Mindset. Uh, Today, I'm super excited to have a good friend of mine, Alex Wu, join us. Um, So Alex, if you could go ahead and introduce yourself real quick, uh, who are you and what is it that you do? Hi, everyone. This is Alex Wu. I'm a food scientist by training. Uh, uh, 10, 15 years ago, I discovered uh, taste and smell neuroscience. So I've been busy applying contemporary taste and smell neuroscience in developing better foods with plant-based ingredients. So so basically I'm a flavor technology specialist. You know, that's really interesting. I don't think I ever really asked you this. You said, you know, about 15 years ago, you kind of fell into neuroscience. What drew you to neuroscience? Yeah, it's a, you know, traditionally food science is based on chemistry and engineering and microbiology. But I always feel uh, something is missing. Mm. So for a hundred years, we focus on making foods. And we, I believe the, the missing 50% is all reaction to the food in front mm. of yeah. during eating and drinking. That's called flavor, which is a cross-modal integration of five senses. Yeah, so there's a lot kind of going in there and you just kind of wanted to understand what that is? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I believe the more uh, you can apply uh, technology from other industry like neuroscience, the more powerful food science will be. you will be able to make food science better, not only for us, but also for the planet. That That's a good way to kind of get into what is exactly a food scientist? What is it that you do? Yeah, food science is the the study of processed food. So it's based on uh, basic principles in microbiology, chemistry, and engineering. So you basically uh, uh, learn the science and technology behind making food that is processed from uh, agricultural raw material like fruits and vegetable and meat into uh, food that taste good and uh, and cheap for the masses and will last mm. for like a year. You know, so an example would be uh, fruit become fruit juice, uh, sugar become candies, cocoa become chocolate, and meat become jerky, for example. Those are the, uh, the, to- the, the topic that we learned, uh, you know, milk to, into cheese. Uh, in yeah. terms of uh, uh, the science and technology needed. So it's like transforming those ingredients into something else, something that is more mass consumable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, consu- uh, convert uh, things from perishable to shelf mm. using science and technology. Now, is that something you always wanted to do? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I had kind of accidentally run into it. I think I was good in chemistry, but the selection of uh, food science uh, uh, as a a topic uh, uh, 30 years ago was sort of accidental. 
What do you mean? What happened? Well, you know, this is maybe uh, personal, but oversharing or not. <laughs> I was like aimless uh, in undergraduate. Uh, it uh, it was, I had a plant pathology uh, major, which I was not so interested in. So I have a few close friends. They said, let's go to the United States. Uh, I was in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that study uh and then I say study what and then my friend <laughs> said who passed away already he said well I heard food science is a good topic because there's lots of jobs so oh. that's how I run into it I picked food science and I'm so happy I did wow so that is very serendipitous where did where did you go I went to University of Wisconsin Madison well that's quite different than Taiwan yeah yeah it's like <laughs> But uh, yeah, I went there and studied food science and I got a master's degree and later on I got a, a PhD degree. Master was in natural color and mm. uh, PhD was in natural flavor. Wow, that, that's great. Um, so that's worked out quite well. Now, if you could speak a bit about your journey into this world of, of food science. Um, I know you focused a lot on sweeteners. How did you end up kind of going towards sweeteners? Yeah, I work for uh, what I call big food uh, uh, nowadays, uh, like Pepsi, Kraft, and Wrigley for 20-some years. Mm -hmm. And 15 years ago, I started my own company. And uh, I uh, uh, was I was following uh, advice uh, uh, as uh, the, the a few of the basic advice for setting up a, a technology consulting company. Once one of them is finding a niche. Mm. So I specialize in flavor and within that it becomes sweeteners and natural flavor modifiers and bitterness blocker mm. and, and multi-sensory experience become a couple of my practice areas. And those are really the hot topics in the past 15 years. Yeah. Uh, so I pick a niche, but I kind of follow my client in terms of what sub subject mm -hmm. want to study underneath that taste and smell, uh, which is a niche, but it's still pretty broad. Yeah. You know, it's really interesting. The general public themselves don't really realize the amount of work that goes into producing the food that they eat all the time. And the example I like to give people all the time is you like orange juice, right? And mm -hmm. they'll usually say yes. And I say, well, when you buy your orange juice in January versus August or, you know, March versus October, um, you expect it to taste the same, right? <laughs> and then we say, well, yes, of course. And I'm like, but it shouldn't, <laughs> right? Um, and so that's a lot of that taste mod modulation, you know, whether there's a hurricane that comes through a certain part of the world, or, you know, if, it happens to be that the fruit is out of season. People expect their food to taste exactly the same, no matter what happened, right? Yeah, I think uh, uh, that's true. But on the other hand, nowadays, uh, knowing uh, the uh, some of the uh, things that may be overdone mm. uh, in terms of making making food too craveable oh. and too attractive, and then uh, we tend to overeat in this country and then obesity is a problem. So nowadays I actually believe don't go too crazy on highly processed food to make the food so the same and perfectly sweet and perfectly yellow like orange juice. We want to focus on how do you make an acceptable food that is still mm. can be cheap enough but minimally process. Yeah. Try not to process so much. Try to have an ingredient statement like five or less and try not to try to use simple and real food. And this is the direction I believe uh, that the kind of the small food of the, of, of the United States, uh, part of the food industry are working. Mm. Whereas uh, big four are uh, also searching for so solution to crack the code. Do you is that like a a thing you see happening more like the rise of small food? Yeah, 
it's still a very small percentage of the market share for the whole food industry, but I believe some of the, the principle they're demonstrating and the best practices they have is, is the future of food. Yeah. Now, something you said there is really interesting. You were talking about acceptability, really, right? So how can you make something acceptable to the consumer? And and that seems like a loaded word in a way, because it can mean a lot of things. So what do you think acceptability means for the basic consumer? Yeah, I think I'm uh I I'm like more like a taste and smell guy. This this is uh probably uh I it's my uh my uh, opinions, but I think about acceptability as both wanting mm -hmm. and liking. Yeah. Liking and wanting, as you are the expert in this field, uh, are two different things, but they like go together. So the acceptability has to be uh, for both of those uh, factors to be complete, at least those two factors. So then what do you do as more of like a food scientist's perspective when you come in to do your work, do your research, do your creation? How do you navigate that balance between creating products that are enjoyable and satisfying for the consumers on what they want and like, but also considering the health impacts? Because that sounds like it's also something that's really important to you. Yeah, it, it make uh, food that's not only better for a uh, human, but uh, better for the planet. Yeah. So that comes to uh, utilizing some new emerging technology uh, that will enable you to do that. So one of them is neuroscience. So neuroscience is like understanding why sugar is sweet mm -hmm. and why uh, table salt is salty. And if you know how it works and why it works, and you can come up with other ways to make things sweet without sugar, and that's called sugar reduction. And also to make uh, things saltier, uh, without table salt, uh, by making it more umami and kakumi. Mm -hmm. So those are the uh, kind of the better for your food coming from uh, uh, new technology like neuroscience. There are others like precision fermentation is another one. Um, so tell me a little bit about these advances. So you say precision fermentation. Tell me a little bit, can you discuss like some of the recent advancements in this space or the trends in sweeteners or in, in flavor modulators? You know, something that you think is particularly exciting or promising. Yeah, I consider precision fermentation as one of the top three. What is emerging. it? The precision fermentation. Mm -hmm. You know, because yeah. there are people who are listening. Yeah, precision fermentation is kind of a new variant of the traditional fermentation. Traditional fermentation is how we make bread and uh, beer. We ferment with yeast, traditional yeah. native yeast found in nature, and we make a, a new food. Whereas precision fermentation become a new emerging technology in the past 10 years, it's about using GMO yeast. Uh, so they, they, these yeast are reprogrammed to not make new food in general, but, but more specifically make a new food ingredients. So in high yield and high efficiency. So uh, and require nearly no water and it's done in a fermentation tank, not in farming. So it's a way of making high value, uh, very uh, uh, high value added food ingredient cheaper faster more sustainable more sustainable sense. yeah more sustainable so less carbon footprint less water re, re, uh, requirement uh high efficiency so no volume limitation and that kind of thing so uh so you start typically with some kind of a sugar source like uh, sugar can or corn syrup you end up uh, with these high value Ingredients. So one example, there are sweetener, flavor, and others. So sweetener, one very famous example is Rebaudiosi M, uh, as in Mary. That's the best tasting stevia sweeteners in the leaf. There are 60 of them. This is the yeah. best tasting one. But there's so little in the leaves. <sighs> it's really 
almost uh, impossible at low cost. So it's possible at high cost, but there are alternative way of making it. Precision fermentation is one way by a couple of leaders in the field and they can make 95% typically or higher purity of this powder that is Robotiocyte M, uh, almost 100% pure. Uh, okay. and that are cheaper, more available, more sustainable than the traditional farm-based stevia leaf extract. So that will be one example. There are other flavor examples and color example and protein example too. That's really interesting. And, you know, you've said some words there that I think can be triggering to people, right? So some people react very poorly when they hear things like GMO. So we often see debates around the safety or efficacy of <clears throat> any of these sort of manipulations that we make, thinking artificial sweeteners in particular, but other types of sweeteners um, that people can be concerned about. How do you address concerns and maybe even more especially the misconceptions in this type of work? Yeah, we should separate these things. Uh, so artificial versus natural is one yeah. topic. There's definitely there's a migration from artificially made sweetener like aspartame, sucralose ASK towards quote unquote natural. There's no legal definition in the US, but mm. natural can be quote unquote, uh, can be uh, think about as plant-based or found in nature. So these there's a migration from the artificially made to the natural one like stevia. Uh, leaf extract like monk fruit extract mm -hmm. so so that's one so that's better uh i'm for that i'm for migration towards plant-based sweetener because they are found in nature consumed uh by people in a certain part of the the the, the world mainly asia for hundreds of years without mm -hmm. uh, any safety concern so gmo is different gmo is a uh, uh, it come started in Europe uh, when the U.S. followed in the past 20 years. Uh, it is uh, important to know whether things are made with GMO uh, or not. Uh, but they are. Uh, uh, so I'm sort of uh, torn on this. But yeah. I'm, I think in general, I will say I'm more pro-GMO. Mm -hmm. rather than against GMO because it's a trade-off. Yeah. Now, the GMO, uh, if the GMO is making new food, I'm more wary about it. Say making a fish that's never been found in nature. Oh, but, yeah, sure. Yeah. But if it's making a nature identical or found in nature molecule, like in this case, people are making Reb M mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. successfully, it's found in nature, it's just rare. So... To make it more available, uh, I am for using GMO. And the GMO, as a minimum, you need to demonstrate there is no GMO DNA or protein whatsoever in the final product that you are uh, oh, making. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, because it's also more sustainable, I think it's a way to kind of save our earth. So I am in on balance, I will say I'm pro GMO. Or even, you know, sustain life because, you know, we're lucky to live in, in a situation where we have a lot of access to food, but not everybody does, you know, and so being able to develop rice, for example, that has more nutrient in it or is more hardy for growth is certainly beneficial. Yeah, as long as the nutrient that we're making as part of the rice is found in nature. You know, I'm not in the medical field, but I I, I do sugar reduction weight management, so I touch upon insulin. Mm -hmm. I believe all the insulin today as a mat, as a drug is all made by uh, GMO. Right, I think so. Uh, precision fermentation. Yeah. So yeah. that technology has been used uh, in, in medicine before food. I need to check that out though. So maybe you want to edit this part. Out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, yeah but, we can always go back and check around. Yeah, I, I don't have an image of a paper <laughs> I read, uh, but yeah, that's just, uh, I mean, the other thing is, uh, uh, I have read recently, there's a generational 
change okay. in terms of the GMO acceptance from uh, boomers who are more against it mm. towards millennials and Zs. They are more open oh, to really? trade off as long as there is a benefit that's yeah. uh, that is better for the planet and better for human life. I read um uh, and 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 it kind of makes sense to me. The younger generation are more open to new technology, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I don't know whether that's been collaborated and supported by, by basically original research or just uh, people self-reporting. That's that's interesting because um, you know a lot of talk at the more recent sensory conferences and. Um, you know, food science conferences has been around plant-based, right? So mm -hmm. you you go to these meetings and it's just constantly papers and posters and presentations on plant-based foods and acceptability. Um, and there seems to be a real problem in maybe Western cultures on acceptability of like plant-based burgers, for example. But from what I'm hearing from you, it sounds like there might be generational differences on understanding those trade-offs, because I think a lot of like the targeting they've tried to do in the U.S. has been the benefits, right, of plant-based meats um, on the environment, not so much the health, right, because like the Impossible Burger or the Impossible Whopper, right, is not healthier, Mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. people but the idea is more that it is more sustainable or more eco-friendly right yeah yeah it's a an a animal free uh plant based uh, in uh, the in the in the case of the example that you use it's really they they find a way to make meat meat flavors yeah using plant heme based compound which is responsible for the meaty and bloody flavors Mm -hmm. and, but it's it's really about saving the earth and and primary, not saving human. Yeah, it's not harmful for human, but it's really the, I think Impossible Foods' is a mission is uh, is really about making the world a better place. Right, and so how do you feel <laughs> about um a lot of these plant based foods moving forward? Like, what do you think the accept is? Or do you think that the Western diet is going to be more accepting of this? Or, I think so. I think so. It will be a viable, important option as we move into the the next decades to come. We will not have enough meat to go around, right? And so, uh, a, a a option is definitely uh, a non animal option is definitely in play. I mean, plant-based right now has, is suffering some headwinds, uh, both technologically and also uh, commercially. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't think it's going to go away. It, we'll have to regroup. Two things, you know, is one is like taste, but the other one is cost. Yeah. So on the taste, uh, my thinking is actually... Uh, Maybe you don't want to match the original animal yeah. flavors, such as um, in non-milk, dairy milk, or no cow cheese without cow. Right. And uh, maybe the focus could be uh, make it equally acceptable. Mm. Uh, a product that, that doesn't match the... Uh, the original taste of the animal product. The other yeah, because I think cost. the push to make it the same pretty much leads to disappointment, right? Because if it's not the same at all in any tiny variation, then mm -hmm. people automatically will say it's not as good, right? Yeah, it's tricky to do. To match the animal flavor is harder to than creating a plant base <clears throat> equally like wanted. Yeah. Uh, so it really like, needs to be its own thing. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I definitely see that as well. Um, kind of getting back to like taste modulation, and this kind of relates to this because as you, you know, the, the people creating these products are manipulating different 
pieces of the puzzle, right? Um, you know, all of my years at Monell and now working more on the consumer research side, um, something that really comes up is that difference between the, the basic research that's happening at places like Monell and the actual application of this research to make real products is taste preferences. So we know that taste preferences can vary hugely, greatly among individuals. Um, so how do you, in your work, account for this variability? Like what implications does individual genetics and taste preferences, um, what does that have on food product development? You know, especially when you're talking about making mass produced foods, you can't really cater to, you know, taste genetics, right? Yeah, you have, you have to take an average, starting by never do taste tests with one person, <laughs> which is very commonly done in startup. Oh, really? Uh, oh, just oh, like yeah. the brand manager? <laughs> no, this, I'm more like talking about the startup where it's a strong man or strong woman mm. company, and uh, I decide it tastes good to me, go. It doesn't take <laughs> go back. So... So it, uh, to accommodate for the great variability in basic taste using sweeteners, sweetness or bitterness as, as an example, uh, you have to do at least uh, uh, six to 10 people uh, taste tests using a format called yeah. flash profiling. Which Just is to cover random. those people. Yeah. yeah, it's, you know, it's randomly selected, not, not trained. So... In a typical food uh, company, we roughly uh, has more female than female mm. in R and and in marketing. Roughly, yeah. So if you take a random sample, you you got sixty forty, which is close enough to the population of fifty one forty nine in, in mm -hmm. terms of gender divide. Uh, I understood. And then an untrained, and then the samples are randomized, uh, uh, random number, random order, same temperature, same size, same cups. And uh, so you have a chance of getting one third people as uh, non-tasters, or I should say more accurately, less sensitive taster, average taster, more sensitive taster in terms of bitterness and sweetness. And uh, it's gender sort of balance. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, phenotype sort of balance uh, variability. So you try to do it uh, at a certain set time, like late morning, mid afternoon. So you take out the satiety uh, uh, factor, hopefully, mm. uh, that kind of thing. So it start with doing the taste, the right kind of taste test so that you guide R&D from discovery to uh, uh, commercialization rather than misguided with one person tasting. So what can a, what does a food scientist do when they see the research come out about prop tasters, right? Or, um, you know, the latest taste genetics work, you know, what, what does someone that's in the business that say, you know, a food scientist at a large food manufacturer what are they supposed to do with that information? Yeah, so this is, uh, I, I think there are very few of us in the food industry that try to apply mm. really intensively uh, as a mission, uh, translating uh, neuroscience into food science. So, uh, because it's not thought of yet, uh, as a main foundation for food science, but it's coming. Yeah. It's like they don't teach product development 30 years ago in food science. Now they do. Yeah. They only teach chemistry and micro microbiology. So this in, in embedding neuroscience in food science uh, is coming. It has, it's being done mm -hmm. in the past five years. It's just not enough. For example, is uh, maybe less than 10 professors in food science. They are really neuroscientists. Yeah. They're practicing their science and technology in food science. So uh, I won't name them if you don't want me to, but Ohio State uh, has yeah, go ahead. one or two professors yeah. uh, uh, 
you can edit this out if you if you no think. no it's totally fine. I'm not promote. I'm yeah. I, I all of them actually. I'm not endorsing a uh, Chris yeah, Simons yeah. and Devin Peterson. Right. Uh, uh, Dan Dando in uh, Cornell. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Lim in Oregon State. Seal in uh, uh, Arkansas. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a uh, there are there are more so there are, uh, and then of course uh, the whole Monel yeah, yeah all about taste and smell and taste and smell their medical aspect but they're you know I look at it through the lens of food yeah so yeah. those are the leading neuroscience neuro food scientists I I I call them yeah. uh, that are typical food scientists doing product development, trying to make food better, uh, should pay attention to it. It's kind of painful mm. because uh, uh, just like I went through this journey uh, 10, 15 years ago, I think the first time I went to Monel, yeah. uh, not Monel, to ACAM. Yeah. Uh, maybe I saw you there. Yeah, this probably. Is 15 years, 15, <laughs> 10 years, I go every year. Uh, I actually understand only one percent of what everybody is saying. So I, but I, I just even that one percent, I started to realize, oh, it's T one R two, T one R three, the only receptor we have. That that's why sugar is sweet. The Venus flytrap. Then I said, oh, 